And we've got the all ladies show today. It's going great. And we've got the two Connies, the Connie squared. I got Connie one, which is <laughs> registered nurse Connie Allison. I got Connie two, that is Connie Connor from Copley Madad Cred Law Firm. And we are going to be talking about reckless injury. And the reason I got these two on together, because if you're doing reckless injury and uh, causing some serious injury out there because you don't know how to shoot your weapon, you got Connie Allison, the registered nurse, going to show you or tell you how to fix it up. So first, let's introduce y'all. Connie, Connie, say hi. Hi. Hello. How y'all doing? Okay. <laughs> say who you are, where you're from, what you're doing, and then get into what you want to talk about. Go ahead, Connie. Hi. As Matt said, my name is Connie Connor, and I do work for Capilano Dodd and Krebs here in Cameron, Texas. We're personal injury attorneys. My segue changed after listening to the ladies thus far and a little prior to the show. I don't own a gun, I've never owned a gun, I've never shot a gun. Listening to the stories and to, you know, Cindy's self-defense and Connie's being vulnerable type situations, I, I may be rethinking <laughs> of a, owning a gun. I am not against firearms, it's just something I never had to do. Um, so I may be looking to purchase a firearm and by all means, go to Aaron's gun shop for the proper training. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Good plan. Um, as Matt said, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about recklessness. There's recklessness with a lot of things in life. Um, working for a personal injury lawyer, I can say the majority of what I do is relevant to recklessness. I handle all of our asbestos cases, which most of our clients were Alcoa employees, and they have developed illnesses, some serious illnesses, due to the negligent recklessness of Alcoa, mm -hmm. sad to say. We also handle, handle motor vehicle accidents. Mm -hmm. Most motor vehicle accidents are not negligent recklessness. It's recklessness. Someone was tired, mm -hmm. They worked too long, they fell asleep, or you know, just were just not paying attention to what they were doing and an accident is caused. As Patty had said, when things like that happen, there is a hurt for the victim, whether it's physical, emotional, financial. Of course, neither one of those situations I just gave have anything to do with a gun. It's more on the recklessness side. You know, people can be negligent, it generally, if you are negligent with your recklessness, that's where trying to defend yourself, if you were to have charges brought up on you, is probably not a good idea. Um, if you are negligently reckless, in some cases that can be a criminal suit. You've broken the law. You knew that that vehicle you let your wife drive had no brakes. Mm -hmm. So um, how would you say that that relates to like a situation like a self-defense? So if you were in your home and someone comes into your home um, and you're forced to use your, in your mind, you're forced to use your weapon, um, what, what kind of things you need to be aware of, um, like as far as like negligence, like what kind of thing would make you negligent versus criminal um, in that situation? Well, if someone's in my home, I, I'm not a criminal lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't work for a criminal lawyer, but I would presume if they're in my home, I can do what I need to do to them to protect myself and my children, whether it's a frying pan, a pipe, like Cindy right. talked about, or, or a gun, a firearm, whatever it would be. Um, I don't know that there would be recklessness right. unless I panicked and grabbed it and didn't focus on the perpetrator and so accidentally be about the threat right so if, if someone's a Correct. perceived threat and why they're a threat um hey, Connie, can i interject on that one because i had a question i don't know if you can answer this since you're not an attorney but what uh connie allison was saying this is an example that i've asked and that is what if you're in your home somebody breaks in but you've been drinking and you're over some mm -hmm. type of limit does that cause any problems as recklessness mm -hmm. Again, not an attorney, uh, and we are not defense attorneys. I, 
I cannot truly answer that. Okay. That would be, I would think, my opinion, reckless, negligent recklessness. You, you've been drinking and you've got a gun nearby. Now, if a perpetrator comes in your house there, that's where you kind of cross mm -hmm. that line. But if you're just, if you're drinking and you're playing around and like, hey, look what I have, and the gun goes off and you shoot your friend, mm -hmm. yeah. that's negligent recklessness. Mm -hmm. Because you should know better being under the influence of drugs or alcohol that I really don't want to be messing with this gun. Right. So if somebody's breaking into your house, it could change a little bit. Well, it could because now they're intruding your right. your personal space and it could be a reckless situation where because of being a little incoherent, you go to shoot that perpetrator and you accidentally shoot the wallet, ricochets off and hits someone in your family or a friend. There, there's so, that fine line there. If you're going to drink at home, make sure you have a, a sober uh, person. A designated a shooter. Yeah, a designated shooter, right? <laughs> I'm usually the designated driver. I don't, I don't know, having not ever shot a gun, if I could be the designated shooter. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So um, in that case, so what I was going to speak about um, a lot is, is kind of after the fact. So like... We talked about um, someone breaks into your home and you're forced to use your weapon, um, and then what? So you shoot someone, what are you going to do? First of all, you're going to make sure that the threat is no longer a threat. If the person is still um, capable of hurting you, you want to make sure that they don't have a weapon that they, if they're injured. Um, if they're not moving, um, you want to make sure you, to remove any weapon away from them in case they wake up and still want to hurt you. Um, at any point in this, you want to you want to make sure that you're going to call for professional help. You want to call 911, not only for the police, but for um, EMS. So emergency um, medical personnel that need to be en route to get to you regardless because you don't know what's going to happen or what kind of injuries you or someone else might have. Um, I was thinking too, ladies, if you could blend it together because you've got the legal assistant and the nurse, you do reckless injury, let's say you're out in the parking lot, and because of a lack of training, somebody uh, instead of hits them, instead of hitting the threat, hits three or four other innocent people. So we have criminal um, recklessness here, and then we got Connie on scene, and she can tell you about how to patch things up. So I think that would be a great scenario. Can you kind of talk about something like that? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm you know in a parking lot, like you said, and we had talked about earlier, particularly women. That's where we may be most vulnerable, particularly at night. Um, and I see someone approaching me and I have a firearm and I want to protect myself, but for whatever reason, and I can't think of one off the top of my head, that I panic, which I probably would because, like I said, training. I never shot a gun. I ha don't have the proper training at this point in time. I may shake, my hand may shake and I hit the pole where you return all the baskets and it ricochets and hits three or four other people and Connie Wan is walking with her cart and sees this and as a nurse there's innocent people not dead but on the floor bleed on the ground bleeding mm -hmm. and that's where I would say you know can you help me let's what can we do it was so if, yeah. if you realize that due to a lack of training you may have caused a reckless injury okay absolutely after it happens and now Connie's going to get into her her side of it, what, would, what should you do on the legal aspect of it to maybe cover yourself to the best ability after you've done this reckless injury? What, is there anything you should do that you think? I wouldn't tell them I wasn't properly trained. <laughs> Keep quiet and get an attorney. <laughs> Never admit it. Um, well, I would ha certainly hope that I would have my concealed license. That would be a big no-no to do that, to be in a parking lot and you know, shoot done. someone with my gun and I don't have the proper paperwork and training to do that. Now I may have passed all the training and got that, received that certification, but I don't practice enough. So I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to carry it, but I really don't know what I'm doing. That's recklessness. And then to a degree it's negligent recklessness. Yeah. But I see it, back I see to, it all the time. Right. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Back to, you know, like Susan said, she goes as often as she can on Fridays or whenever to, to practice. And I know I would need to do that for sure. But back to being in this parking lot, I accidentally, because I'm not 
totally trained and I'm a little shaky, I instead of shooting the person who is the troublemaker or is about to commit a crime and harm me, it hits the pole, ricochets and hits other people and Nurse Connie is nearby. Connie, I can't tell you how important what you just said is because people, a lot of people are out there and ladies, you all know, the ones that come to the range a lot, you all know if you don't train, you're a hazard out there. Getting a piece of paper or a card that says you're licensed to carry doesn't mean you be, you're able to use it properly. So, I mean, what you're saying is right spot on. And I mean, that's, that's my true gut. You know, I, I don't even hold a gun because I don't know how to shoot it. Well, I have a question, if I can assert one. I have, I have a question. Okay, you're, you're talking about guns, and, and in this, these days and times, maybe they mostly be a person with a gun, but I've had incidences where somebody would pull a knife. Like my husband actually had somebody pull a knife on him when he was working for the railroad. So it's, you know, if you have somebody pull a knife on you, parking lot, your house, whatever, and you're fighting over this knife, I mean, I know how to redirect a knife and give it back to them. But if you're even if you're accidentally fighting and you know they get stabbed and now they're seriously injured or or they die, mm -hmm. you know what is the legal aspects for that? I mean, especially if they're in your house or mm -hmm. uh, like you were asking if they're trying to j jerk you out of your car and take your car with your baby or you and your car. Never go with anybody. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. yeah. No. Fight. Yeah. Fight. Fight as much as you can. Don't let them take you anywhere because the chances are you're going to come back are probably not very good. Well, and if you fight back, they're more likely to leave you alone because they don't want somebody that's going to fight back. So even appearing like you're going to fight back. Hi, Mike. The mic. Oh, um, even uh, what I was saying is that you, you want to fight back because they're more likely to leave you alone if you fight back. They don't want someone that fights back. They're going to pick you because they think you're weak. So even appearing like you're going to fight back or someone starts approaching you, making sure it's clear, you don't want to mess with me, stop, I don't need your help, you know, go away, making those things clear um, will we'll help with that. But I see on your, your end of it, so if someone does get close to you and someone gets injured, um, so what, what kind of, um, you know, legal ramifications are you looking at there? I'm sorry. He handed uh, me handed, something to read. Oh, okay. article that fits perfectly what you're just saying there. You're, you're yeah. saying if somebody's got a weapon. So, Connie, you might want to touch on that. The article is about people who are... Yes, uh, Matt just handed me an article, which I'm going to read you. It, the headline is, Attempted Mass Shooter Was More Concerned About Concealed Carriers Than Police. This is Second Amendment News. Criminals prefer soft targets, as Connie said. So they seek out ways to avoid armed victims. Recently, a student was arrested for planning to commit a mass shooting. This teenager, who I shall not name or picture, was planning an Islamic State-inspired mass shooting in the Dallas Mall. He apparently hit the FBI's radar in December 2017, and the subsequent investigation provides a lot of very interesting insight into a mass shooter. For example, he considered waiting until he was 18 to purchase a rifle, but was also reading ISIS magazines on how to perform operations and make bombs. The shooter was selecting targets where police response time would be slow. Remember, seconds matter. Connie can attest to that. Police are minutes away. We're talking seconds. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the planned shooter stated that he was more concerned about concealed carriers intervening than police officers intervening from the arrest affidavit that came from. They discussed the possibility that patrons in the mall could be carrying concealed weapons and could draw those weapons when the operation begins to which the suspect says he didn't think a police officer would try and take us on and noted the Parkland, Florida yeah. shooting mm -hmm. and says security officers at the school ran outside. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are mad at him. We know that over 98% of all mass shootings happen in gun-free zones. We also know this particular shooter 
was not deterred by laws or danger to himself. This shooter said, it's not about numbers. It's about getting a message across to the tag hut countries. He wished to kill indiscriminate, indiscriminately, and he was going to do so with or without guns, be it bombs, vehicle, or other means. I thought I thought that article just fit perfectly. It does fit in saying, that, and don't want to fight. Just before, I wanted to just say here. Like I said, I, I, I don't own a gun. I'm not against firearms. But I know there's a lot of outrage right now about the Second Amendment. And when I've done some research, just particularly with the CDC, there are more national, nationwide, more deaths from drug overdoses than there are from gunshot wounds. Mm -hmm. You know what? Drugs are illegal. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so stop so if you make guns illegal, <laughs> they're <laughs> still going to find a way. Yeah. And it could be worse because the wrong person is going to have that gun in their hand. And they're not going to go to Aaron's gun shop and take the training. They don't care about the training. They right. have a... A set purpose. Hey Connie, on those numbers, aren't a lot of those numbers gang related or suicide? So when you come to the well, actual reality of, of uh, somebody doing harm with it, the percentage gets even lower, doesn't it? Um, okay, the CDC's most accurate numbers are only through 2015. Mm -hmm. It takes a while to, but <clears throat> the number one leading death was drug and alcohol poisoning. 26.9% nationwide, with 11.8% of that being suicides. Of like drug overdoses. But you mean right. suicide by fire, firearms. Yeah. Like, no, no, drug and, drug and alcohol. No, no, oh, him. But I, you, I think they right. break it down. Correct me if I'm wrong. They break it down when it comes to gun-related right. instances. Okay. Firearms are only 16.9%. Now, this is what I'm asking. Out of that 16.9%, right. what? 60.7% of that is suicides. There you go. So, and it's third down the list. Mm -hmm. Drug and alcohol, then motor vehicle, then firearms. What was the percentage of suicides again? The overall firearm death is 16.9 mm -hmm. with 60.7% of that And I'll bet you a large suicides. portion after that is probably gang related. M more likely. Okay, just... Keep going. Or, and the or, and where the threat? <laughs> or in for the insurance money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Bobby, what do you do? What do you do when they're bleeding out in the parking lot now? Well, first of all, you want to make sure whoever caused the bleeding is not going to do that anymore. <laughs> Take the gun away from whoever started it, right? Because just stopping the threat is is going to um, uh, be your first first move, and then you want to stop. Um, the majority of the blood. So you want to see where the blood is coming from. So if they have multiple injuries, there's going to be a lot of blood everywhere. Um, if they, if they're, there's some smaller injuries that can bleed a lot. Different areas of your body is um, have a lot more bleeding than others. But you want to watch for life-threatening bleeding, which you're gonna. It sometimes appears movie-like, and it'll be like the spurting with the pulse, and it will be um, shooting farther than just like trickling down someone's mm -hmm. arm. Number one thing you want to do for bleeding is direct pressure. And I'm not talking about you put your palm over it and you say, oh my gosh, you're bleeding. That's not going to help. So what you want to do is, is called thumb over thumb. So you want to put your thumb directly from the, the main source of the bleeding where you see the spurting coming from. And then another thumb over that. And you want to use as much pressure as you can on that one direct spot to try to occlude the blood. Um, now, then you get into if um, you have other equipment with you. The number one thing I think you can have in your vehicle that might save someone's life is a tourniquet. Because if you come up on a motor vehicle accident, in this situation someone is shot, um, having that tourniquet and knowing when and how to use it is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. um, so direct pressure, first of all, and then if you can get the tourniquet, you want to go above the injury and you want to tighten it enough to where, one, you see the bleeding stop. Um, because you can bleed out in a matter of minutes before anyone's ever going to get to you. And then there's a point where you can bleed out enough that it doesn't matter um, if someone does get to you, it's not going to be a lot they can do. I have a question, Connie. Okay. How long does it take for somebody to bleed out if you've got an arterial cut? It depends on where it is and how uh, how severe the, the arterial bleeding is. You can have a nick on an artery and it's going to bleed a lot, but you may not bleed to death for, um, you know, you may have 20 or 30 minutes. Um, if you cut a brachial artery, which is um, 
on the inside of your arm, like under your armpit, if you if you cut that artery, I mean, within minutes. Connie, um, Connie, let me ask you this. If somebody intrudes into my home and I happen to nick of what she just mentioned, should I call law enforcement about three minutes later? <laughs> 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 or should I call immediately? <laughs> I think you got what I was trying to say. Yeah, I do get what you're trying to say. Um, that, you don't have to answer. No. Answer. <laughs> no, well, you... Well, okay. It's not going to matter, ultimately. It, probably it but. wouldn't, because if even if you called right, right then, like in this story you gave me, it's going to take the police generally minutes. Especially, look where we are. We're out in the country. All it right. could take half an hour sometimes. <laughs> Most of what we have, you know, the... the mm -hmm. The EMS and law enforcement, more so fire, are, they're, there's very few of them in this area, so it could, the person's going to be dead before they get there. And me, personally, being out in the country, I've seen um, emergency vehicles go into a location, and I know where the location is, and they're passing it up and down, looking at driveways, not sure where mm -hmm. it goes, so that adds on to the response time. Sure. Well, and that uh, brings me to another point, too, is that um, in that situation, that's why it's important for you to not only be trained to use your firearm, but to be trained in first aid and emergency stuff, because I know what I'm doing, because that's my job, but a normal person's not going to know. But what are you going to do if it's your family member or yourself that's injured? Um, you're not going to have help come right away. So knowing what to do just long enough to get the professionals there is very important. That's why everyone should take, you know, basic first aid and then um, like CPR because um, that's what's going to save your family member's life, initiating that stuff uh, sooner. Um, so and then in another situation, so say someone breaks into your home and you shoot them, okay, now they're unconscious, you don't know if they're dead or not, so then what do you do? You, you know, make sure they don't have a gun and they're not going to hurt you, but then um, check yourself and your family and make sure you're okay. And then you want to check this person. Um, say they do, they do still have a pulse, but you see that they're bleeding. Then what do you do? Do you render aid? Um, you should call for help. And then, I mean, no one wants to kill someone. It's not, you don't set out your day. But if someone's trying to harm you, you want to stop the threat. So um, ideally, you want to take action until you stop the threat. Once the threat is stopped, then, um, then you can render aid as, as you feel comfortable. Um, you, you know, you don't this person can um, face legal actions later, but, um, you know, that's, that's kind I of a, a good question. point. This is going to sound weird, but I think you all know me by now. I mean it seriously. As women, do you find yourself um, a little bit more apprehensive or nervous in a protection scenario of yourself, or do you feel if you have a weapon, and Ms. Key, you're, you're a little different because you are the weapon, okay? <laughs> but a woman who's not... Uh, martial artist or whatever, do you feel as though a gun is an equalizer for you? Absolutely. If you're properly 100%. trained. If you're properly trained. Um, I, I feel pretty comfortable with the firearm. I've done, you know, pretty um, good training with it. I practice with it, and um, I, I feel like that makes me feel more comfortable to be able to protect myself, especially uh, having a young child. A lot of times they're distracting, um, and when you're distracted, you're not able to be as aware of your surroundings. I think women, um, you know, take it, um, have a harder time with that because they, they are not as aware of their surroundings.